Sunday morning at Marx's library. Um, we, we meet every Sunday for about 15 years or more uh, discussing issues related to revolution, socialism, communism, and the struggles of the working class. Um, our physical home um, until this recent pandemic was at the Marxist Library, the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California. Um, but since that time, uh, we've been meeting exclusively online um, through one of these services, um, meeting services, Zoom in this case, um, and we'll continue to do that until we return to the library and hopefully we will have a, um, a blended kind of meeting, physical and virtual. But for the time being, welcome to all our uh, attendees from around the world. Um, um, our topic today is um, the, the political military strategic outlook for Russia in Ukraine. And we're very fortunate to have as our speaker, Mark Albertson, who is a historical research editor at Army Aviation Magazine in Connecticut and a, and a historian for the Army Aviation Association of America. He's authored numerous books and has taught at the Norwalk Community College. Um, in 2005, Mark was presented with a citation from the uh, Connecticut legislature for his work uh, on the history of the battleship Connecticut. With that, I would, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Albertson. Yeah, good, good morning, morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I know for with me, I'm in, I'm, I'm in the afternoon over here, being I'm in Connecticut. So, uh, so for the rest of you, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're, you've been following, and I'm sure some of you avidly, what's been going on in Eastern Europe uh, in the past couple of weeks, going on two and a half weeks, uh, the so-called Russian incursion into, into Ukraine. Uh, this is an area that no, that is no, that is no uh, stranger to war. Uh, you, uh, the, one of the reasons is the numerous border changes. You know, we've had, we've had a plethora of border changes in this area, and whenever you find border changes, or for that matter, people who have lost territory, they always want it back. And it seems that when people have had a taste of empire, some people never get out of the habit. It's almost like a, having an empire is like a drug. Of course, in the modern era, the empire, empire requires control of resources and, and financial domination. That's what all great powers want. Uh, that's what they all want. However, here, uh, starting with Ukraine, I, th I think, and, and it's not just the Russians here. I mean, the, 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 the Russians in our press take it, on the, take, it on the, take it on the jaw here. And we seem to leave out, seem to leave out the fact that the United States, uh, the European Union are just as culpable here. And we can't ignore the fact that China, India, Japan, they all want resources too. They're modern states. You can't keep your population sedate. You can't keep them calm if, if you don't have resources to run a functioning economy. It just doesn't happen anymore. Those, the, the, the days of doing without oil, natural gas, so on and so forth are over. Despite the fact many people are going to renewables, solar is becoming popular, wind is becoming popular, so on and so forth. Heck, even the Swedes are even burning garbage here. And it's not like we don't produce garbage either. But the fact of the matter is, uh, yes, the, the, the name of the game is resources. And the name of the game is financial domination. And Ukraine is caught up in the middle of this. However, a good place to start with this, though, is with the collapse of the Soviet Union in that period, 1989, 1991. And what did we see here with regards to Ukraine? Ukraine all of a sudden was the third ranking nuclear power in the world. And why is that? Because some of the Soviet, the Soviets had some of their nuclear weapons on sconced in Ukraine, in particular intercontinental ballistic missiles. And so with the trilateral agreement of January 1994, uh, began that process of denuking 
Ukraine. Now, again, taking away the nuclear weapons from Ukraine and, and, the, and the fact that they were the third ranking nuclear power in the world at, at this time period, you know, that's not going to go over well in Washington, in London, Moscow. They don't want any more. They don't want any more members to that club, to the nuclear, nuclear weapons club. This, this is a prestigious club, but they don't want anybody else here. So you have to denuke Ukraine. Now, in doing so, yes, uh, Lund, uh, Lund, Washington and, and, and Moscow are going to, let's use the term, assist them. But, and, and then and Ukrainians are going to give up their nukes. They will give them up, starting with the low-level nukes, bombs and so on and so forth. Many are going to go back to Russia. However, what about the intercontinental ballistic missiles? You know, they had 130, 130 SS-19s, each able to carry six warheads, all pointed at the United States. They also had, they also had 46 SS-24s, which could carry upwards of 20, uh, of upwards of 10 nuclear warheads. So with each warhead, you can target an American city or district if you so chose to. So what those, what's going to happen with those weapons? They're going to be hauled out of the silos and they're going to go back to Russia, the Russian Federation. The Russians will either destroy them or save them, but they're not going to be in Ukraine anymore. And what happened to the silos? The silos were actually blown up, torn apart, or filled with concrete and capped. In fact, the last silo was destroyed in 2001. The process took that long. However, here, there were also at the, at the, at the time of this denuclearization, 30 bear and blackjack bombers. And so those bombers will go back to Russia. Now they were able to carry upwards of 416 nuclear bombs. So the, the, the fascinating aspect here is that Ukraine is denuclearized, but they sign another agreement on December 5, 1994. This is the Budapest Memorandum. And here, here, four countries will sign this agreement. Ukraine, uh, the, the, the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and who signs for this is John Major. He was the prime minister then. Uh, Ukraine, and then also the uh, Boris Yeltsin signed for Russia, uh, the, the Russian Federation. But then again, Bill Clinton signs for the United States. He's the president. Two days later, following this, this document is, is exposed to the United Nations. Now, the four, amb four ambassadors from four of the countries concerned at the United Nations will forward a letter to the General Secretary of the United Nations, the General Assembly. And this, and this document bolsters the, mem the Budapest Memorandum. And here you will have the UN ambassadors from the countries concerned signing this and turning it over to the General Secretary of the United Nations. This is December 7. 1944, 1994. And here, this will be signed off on for the Russian Federation by Sergei Lavrov. He was, he was the ambassador to the UN for the Russian Federation. David Hannay will sign for the United Kingdom. And I'm sure some of you folks remember this lady. She signed for the United States. Madeleine Albright, remember her? She signs this document for the United States. Now, with this Budapest Memorandum, this is interesting. They all agree to this. All the major powers concerned agree to this. Number one, that, that Ukraine's territorial integrity will be respected. Number two, Ukraine's political structures will be respected. Three, Ukrainian sovereignty will be respected. Now, <laughs> what's happened to Ukraine since 1994. The point here is they denuclearized. In fact, John Mearsheimer wrote an, art, wrote an article, and I think it was in Foreign Affairs back in 1994, about Ukraine maintaining its nuclear weapons. It's an interesting article. But that, but that being the case, since they are denuclearized, and since there's been, there's been meddling for years in Ukraine by outside powers, what do you think? What do you think the mindset here is in Tehran, Pyongyang? How about Islamabad? How about Jerusalem? Let's throw the Israelis in here. 
What do you think they feel? How do you think they feel about this agreement, even though they're not a part of this? In other words, with the, when the big powers sign an agreement, their signature isn't worth the paper it's printed on. That's the message here. If you don't want to be bothered, get a nuke. Isn't that the message here? Of course, that's the message here. And yet we don't want to see nuclear weapons spread. But beyond that, there's the other side. There, there, there's, there's, there's really another issue here as well. The great game. The great game for resources. You know, that thing that's been played in this world since the 18th century. Let's, let's go with the modern era here. The British, all right, the British in particular, they were the world's ranking colonial power, despite competition from France. Of course, even here, Spain is on its way down, Portugal, the, 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 the Dutch. But here you see that the, that, that the British do not want the Russians getting into the Middle East or Asia. You know, Russia is building a contiguous empire. In fact, if you, if you want to make comparisons here, from the 18th through the 19th century, as they are expanding, they are expanding. They are not doing anything any different than the Anglo-Saxon was doing here on the American continent, right? Only here, there's less time zones. But the, but, but the process is virtually the same. Both the United States and Tsarist Russia are building contiguous empires. They don't, need, they don't need navies for far-flung empires like the British, like the French, like the Spanish, like the Portuguese needed, or the Dutch. Besides, how are you going to build a contiguous empire in Europe? Where are you going here? So, but on Russia and on the American continent, you are seeing this constant expansion here. In fact, you can read uh, that, that word empire is actually used by a number of the founders here before the 18th century is out. What does that tell you, right? However, the game for resources, this is important, going into the 19th century, France is going to make a comeback, Napoleon III. Where is he going? How about Southeast Asia? And that leads to Vietnam, you know where that's going to go. But again, the British still did not want Russia getting into Afghanistan and also the crown jewel of their empire, India. You know, it's fascinating when, when, when you take a look at, 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 at the British in 1763, and I'm talking about the, the British East India Company, because they're the ones that begin to spread this. They moved into Basra in 1763, and in 1768, the British government will open up a consulate here. Then by 1798, the British East India Company's in Baghdad. And four years later, the British, British government puts a consulate in Baghdad. Because even here, the Ottoman Empire is totter, is beginning to totter here. And so they're gonna fit, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, the British are moving into Mesopotamia. Why? To plug that gap that they feel is a threat to Afghanistan. And I offer this to some people who are students of American history. This is one reason why the British could not send more troops to, the, to, the, to, to America during the American Revolution. At top end, they only had 45,000 troops here to fight the American colonists. And one quarter of them were German Hessians. They were mercenaries because they didn't have enough men. Even here, the British Empire is, is, is strapped. And so what we don't teach here is the effect, the, I'm talking the positive effect, of the colonists beating the British because the British are getting involved in the Middle East. And the British will continue to get involved in the Middle East throughout the 19th century. You know, that, that you know. You know, that you know. Why? To keep the Russians out. They don't want the Russians here. And so the great game is continuing to be played in the 19th century with the French getting in. And then another power gets in, the Germans. And that made the British happy because the Germans can be considered at one point here a greater threat than Russia. Why? Because they're industrialized. And let's understand something. I gave a talk on this the other day, a man by the name of Fritz Haber, one of the, one of the most influential people of the modern era. One of the, him and Edward Bernays, two of the most influential people of the entire 20th century. They are. Haber, by the way, introduced chemical warfare in the modern era in 1914, 1915, 
And Edward Bernays, <laughs> the father of American consumerism, how to channel mass opinion. Even the Nazis wanted to hire him and he said no. Anyway, interesting because now you're seeing two other countries get involved in this club, the Japanese and the United States. Well, why the United States here? Because the Civil War, you know, we, we always talk about the Civil War as the Civil War. <laughs> this is America's first industrialized war. That's what this is. It's the revolt of the planters, a revolution from the right by the plantation owners. But here is a war with a bunch of farmers or agrarians making war in a nation of wrench turners. Who do you think is going to win a conventional war of this type? It's not going to be the farmers. It's going to be the wrench turners. And, it, and, there's, and there's several people here who understand this. Ulysses Simpson, Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, and Phil Sheridan. That's why they're going to take it to the Southern economy. But what does this do? This ends that confrontation between the Jeffersonian notion of the agrarian as assault of the earth and therefore the best protector of the Republican government and the, and the Hamiltonian notion of industrialization slash finance. Who won the war? The Hamiltonian notion. And that's where this country's going to go. Keep in mind in the United States here, in 1860, this country produced $2 billion in, in manufactured goods. By 1900, 11 and a half billion, it went up five and a half times in four decades. We go from 131,000 factories to upwards of 300,000 factories, and we knock the Brits out of first place as the world's industrialized power. But once this is done, you know, by 1898, Chesapeake Bay is linked with the Golden Gate. This, this idea of manifest destiny as a continental agenda is over. It now becomes an agenda of globalism. And we, this country is cutting its ties to its colonial roots and joining the people through out of here by 1783. And that's the British and the, and, the, and the imperialist powers. Japanese are doing the same thing at this point, only they are a black sheep of the group. You know, many Europeans didn't want to see the Japanese in this group because they have round heads, slanted eyes, and yellow skin. There goes the neighborhood. But the Japanese are getting involved anyway. They're in this club now, especially after the 1945 Russo-Japanese War, where an Asiatic power beats a European power. The, the, the slow change here is coming. You can see it with this war. You can see it with the 1898 war. And keep in mind, keep in mind what Albert Beveridge said in, 19, in 1898. You know, what Americans don't realize here is the Spanish-American War, which nobody talks about this four-month war anymore. Nobody talks about it. Yet, it is a linchpin in American history. It is a poster child expression of where America is going. We get the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Cuba becomes a free nation if you wanna believe that one. But we're putting ourselves on the world stage. Between 1898, and I wrote a book on this, it's called They'll Have to Follow You, The Triumph of the Great White Fleet. The round the world cruise of the Great White Fleet was Roosevelt's announcement to the world that we are becoming a global power. And that will be codified by Congress. Another linchpin, April 6, 1917, when Congress issued the declaration of war to get us into what many people call the first world war. We, you know, it's interesting. I find this fascinating with regards to the United States and, the, and, the, and, this, and this becoming a global power and an imperialist power. In 1823, we came out with the Monroe Doctrine. Europeans stay out. Yet on August, April 6, 1917, we involve ourselves in Europe. Have we gotten out yet? No, no. So April 6 is another linchpin in American history. Remember, Woodrow Wilson asked for this declaration on April 2nd. It took four days to deliberate this, four days. Interesting. Well, now we're, on, now, we're, now we're in European affairs and we're not getting off, but it shows you one thing here. The political, strategic, economic agenda is changing in the globe. The Europeans are on the way down. We are on the way up. Russia, 
you know, after the collapse of the of the of the of the Romanovs, is is in a bind right now with the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War. But they but Stalin's going to organize this in the 1930s, and the Soviets will become an industrialized state, probably the second largest industrialized state by 1941. And both the United States and the Soviet Union are going to be the two big winners. I went into this with Herald of a New World Order by 1945. Yet the game, the, 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 the great game of resources is not over. Because what happens on Valentine's Day, 1945? Franklin D. Roosevelt made the deal with Abdulaziz Ibn Saud here. American, American military protection for the kingdom versus preferential access to Saudi crude. And every president, be he Democrat or Republican, has catered to this agenda ever since. And when I give this talk, I always tell, I always tell the an American audience, guess what? You are now the caretakers of the British Empire because no one else can do it from the West. And now your currency is the world's reserve currency. And this is where we're going. You know, the idea of God bless America, America, the beautiful mom's apple pie, forget that. That's, that's, that's in the dustbin of history. And as George Kennan says in 1948, the United States has 6.5% of the world's population, but controls 50% of its resources. This will cause us to be nothing more than the butt of resentment and envy. It is time where Americans give up the idea of democratization and raising other people's living standards. You are now a great power, act like one, and that's precisely where we're going. But interesting too here with regards to resources. You know, it's the United States and the Soviet Union that win, win the great war. And they win the great war because of several things. One, industrialization, especially the United States, but we can't leave the Soviets out of this because from the perspective of beating a German army, they lend lease was only 10, 12% of the Soviet effort. The Soviets do this on their own, virtually on their own. They are the ones that beat the German army. They are the ones that win the land war of what we call the second world war. Of course, this allows the United States to do everything else. It's a marriage made in heaven. Only don't say that today because it won't be accepted. But having said that, they also win because the United States and the Soviet Union are awash in oil. The Germans, the Japanese, the Italians have to go get it. They don't have it. They have to go get it. You think this is an accident they lose? No, it's not. But when 1945 comes around, and, 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 the, and the, the Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin alliance is over with. And that ended, you know, the, the, that, that alliance ended as soon as Hitler put a bullet in his brain. But the fact of the matter is, and Roosevelt dies. Stalin knew what he had with Roosevelt. He doesn't know what he's going to get afterwards. Do you know when Eleanor Roosevelt died? Uh, you know how this is. The first lady gets all these cables and letters and wishes and so on and so forth, right? I mean, Jackie Kennedy got, 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 was swimming in these. But Stalin sent one to Eleanor. You know what was included in it? Have an autopsy done. Thinking maybe, Stalin, thinking maybe Roosevelt got poisoned. Have an autopsy done. And what's Eleanor's reply? Apparently, Mr. Stalin doesn't understand that we are not that way. Now, no, that's 1945. What happened to certain people here in the 1960s in this country, like Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, <laughs> uh, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy? Are we becoming like what we thought the Russians were? Yeah, we are. We are. Why? Because we're becoming a great power. It prostitutes democratic agendas. That's what happens when you become a great power. Why? Because the caretakers of being a great power want more power. And they won't cater to democratic agendas. That's where the country is going. However, if you go back to what happened in 1989, 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the French warned, the French warned that without the Soviet Union, that leaves the United States as the world's sole, sole superpower. That's dangerous. The French understood 
that the balance of power is now out of whack. And without a check, who is going to, who is going to block the United States after the collapse of the Soviet Union? The French are right, you know. They were right. Well, George Kennan at the same time here. You know, that's the issue here. That, you know, that is, is uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, let's understand something here, too, with this. And Putin understands this right now. You know, that, that area of Poland and Ukraine has been a causeway into the Soviet Union for invasion. Well, Napoleon, 1812, right? Germany invaded Tsarist Russia, 1914. The Poles in the Russo-Polish War, 1919-1921, invaded Russia. And Trotsky's Red Army has to throw them out. And then the big one, of course, Adolf Hitler attacks the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, with 3.3 million men. Yet, yeah, let's, 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 let's just stick with the 20th century. Uh, from 1914 to 1945, the Soviets have been invaded three times. They lose more, more than 30 million people in these conflicts. You don't, you don't, you don't forget Stalin for a moment. You don't think some of the Russian people do not want to get out of Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, the Baltic states. You don't think there aren't Russians that want to stay here? Of course there are. Why? Because they've been on the butt of invasions. We don't seem to understand that in this country. And it's, it's not even, it's hardly ever brought up. It's glossed over. Yet, this, yet the reverse argument here is, if the United States had been invaded three times in 31 years into our Southwest through Mexico, do you honestly think that Mexico today would be a sovereign state? No, our border would be on the Guatemalan frontier. Isn't that how big powers operate? Of course they do. But the other, another, another factor here, with regards to this collapse of the Soviet Union and America left, you know, as, as, as the goal, as the so-called so superpower, you know, you get things come and, and this, this leads us to Victoria Newland here in the end, but things like the plan for the new American century, which her husband, Bob Kagan, was a, cult, was a booster of, because why he's a neocon? He's a neocon. Where the United States, and I find this fact, if you've ever read, I have it. If anyone wants this, I'll gladly share it with you. The plan for the new American century, the military program, on page two. Boy, they don't even give this, a, they don't even let this cool off. On page two, they have, a, they have two columns here. The objective of the American military in the Cold War was the containment of the Soviet Union. The objective of the American military in the 21st century is Pax Americana. Isn't that why Iraq was a target? Isn't that why Iran's a target? Isn't that why Syria's a target? Isn't that why Libya was a target? Isn't that why Afghanistan was a target? And they also have uh, North Korea here too. But most of the countries that are targets have one thing in common. And what is that? Oil. Oil. Again, here we are, resources. Look at it now. Ukraine is now a basket case, and yet the big powers still want all these resources. You know, you take a look at Central Asia, take a look at Asia, take a look at the Middle East. How about Africa? And let's not leave out Central and South America here. Let's not leave them out. The big powers, the United, the considered big powers, the United States, the EU, the Russian Federation, China, India, Japan, they want these resources. They want that oil. They want that gas. They want that tungsten. They want that uranium, manganese, iron ore. Uh, how about uh, now with now with, with where the world's going here, lithium for batteries? Does that give you an inkling as to why 11, 10 years after Osama bin Laden was assassinated, America didn't get out of Afghanistan? You would think with 9-11 and going into Afghanistan, once Osama bin Laden had been killed, you're out. No, you're not. So was it for Osama bin Laden or was it for resources? It's resources. Let's understand this. Or, and Bill Dorr wrote on this, how about the pipelines? 
oil and gas pipelines. You know, do, do you, do, does, does the United States really want uh, Europeans buying oil and gas from Russia? Of course not. They want them. They want them buying that oil and gas from us. How about how about the Shia pipeline going from Iraq? After, uh, through uh, from Iran going through Iran. And that's another thing about the Saudis. You think they were happy that we took out Saddam Hussein? The guy was a Sunni. He was that bolster against the spread of Shia fundamentalism. That's why he was left there after the Persian Gulf War number one. The United States had to leave them there if they wanted the if they wanted the Syrians to get on board with that with that coalition or the Jordanians, the Egyptians, the Saudis obviously have to. But they want they wanted Saddam to stay there. No, we took them out. What happened to Iraq? Shia leadership, and that leads to Syria. Assad is what a Shia, and he's in a he's in a country that is seventy two percent Sunni. But the Iranian plans backed by China wanted to build oil and gas pipelines from Iran through Iraq into Syria to the coast and ship the goods to the Europeans. That's not what the Saudis want. They wanted to build oil and gas pipelines from Saudi Arabia through Jordan up into Syria and then to the sea. Why? Sunni oil and gas going to Europe. You know, I mean, the, the, the whole the map is a chessboard. That's how this is seen. And so people like Ukrainians, people like Afghans, Iranians, Iraqis, uh, Syrians, uh, El Salvadorans, Guatemalans, they don't mean anything. They don't mean anything. It's the resources that matter, resources and financial primacy. Those two of the basics of American foreign policy since 1945 because the dollar was the, became the world's reserve currency. How long is that gonna last? I don't know, I don't know. Now let's understand China's role in this too, to a certain extent. What did they do for Putin not all that long ago? Big wheat deal. Why? That gives Putin money. Look at the deal they made eight, eight years ago. You know, about the oil and gas deal, 30 year deal for, for gas for $400 billion. That didn't make the Saudis happy. That did not make the Saudis happy at all. You know, the Saudis and the Russians can be considered something like Al Capone and Bugs Moran vying for the control of the north side of Chicago. It's the same sort of, they were capitalists. They were capitalists, uh, Capone and Moran, pure capitalists. I know it's a local level, but hey, you know, you can make these comparisons here. But at this point, uh, but what about get, getting into the Russian invasion here? Uh, the Russians really haven't gotten that far in a little more than two weeks. Now, what about the Russian army itself? The Russian army, heh, that, that, to, to tell you the truth, the heyday of the Russian army in the 20, going for, you know, in the, in the last 70, 80 years, was probably 1944, 1945. Somebody asked me at a, at, a, at a talk when I was giving on the Great Patriotic War, if I could pick the ideal military, what would I pick? And I said, well, the United States Navy would be number one. It's a two ocean Navy. It's, got, it's backed up by America's industrial might. And by 1944, this is the best trained Navy probably in history. Uh, the United States Army Air Forces, a good blend of fighter aircraft and strategic bombing. And it's again, backed up by the American industrial might. And by 1944, it's probably the best air force in the world. But then I said, if I had to take a ground force, it would be Stalin's Soviet Army. And the reason being is that by 1944, as far as ground forces go, this is the world's greatest killing machine. It has the best tanks. It has people who are up for this at this point because they had gotten invaded. Uh, they, have, they have the largest artillery in the world. 
In fact, when you go back to Operation Bagration, which was Stalin's promise to Roosevelt and Churchill at the Tehran Conference, two weeks after the boys hit the beaches at Normandy, I will launch an attack on the Eastern Front. And, you know, Normandy was quite an operation. It was 156,000 men landing by, you know, landing, hitting the beaches, crash landing by glider or dropping by parachute on a front 50, 60 miles across. And it was quite an operation to plan. But Operation Bagration coming out of Belarusia was on a front 450 miles across, later broadened to 650 miles. It wasn't 156,000 men. It was 2,500,000 men and four huge armies. They had 4,070 tanks, 6,300 aircraft, and get this, over 28,000 pieces of artillery. And German soldiers who survived this onfl onslaught said, you have no clue what an our Soviet artillery bombardment is like. The Soviets had 3 million tons of artillery ammunition for this. Listen, 3 million tons. And they expected each gun to fire two days worth of rounds in two hours. That's the virulence of this, of this bombardment. And if your gun barrel burns out, there is a spare. You just rip the old barrel off, put another on the carriage and keep yanking that lanyard. Just keep yanking it. And in eight weeks, German Army Group Center that had 800,000 men had 670,000 casualties, including 300,000 dead in eight weeks. In eight weeks, not only did the Soviets push the Germans out of Belarusia, they were into Poland. They are on the Vistula River by the end of August 1944, and they are only 350 miles from Berlin. It was one, it was up to this point. It was the greatest allied offensive of the entire war. To me, this is the high point. And why? Because the Russians had a military doctrine. Maybe you've heard of this. Deep penetration, deep battle. You know, the Soviets were not overly excited about winning a war right away. That was the Germans. We got to get this over quick. Not the Soviets. The Soviets would, would, would crash deep into somebody's territory and, 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 and forge losses. But they weren't interested in getting it over right away. Why? Because they wanted to get the enemy in a battle of attrition. They had the resources. They had, do you know, Stalin had a manpower pool of some 40 million a drawn? 40 million. United States doesn't have this. British don't have this, China might, but nobody else, 40 million. They're gonna lose a lot of them, yes. Now, how does that compare to today? The Russians have an army today of about 840, 850,000 men. Of course, this is not the Soviet Union anymore. Let's remember that, that's important. That's very important. They don't have the population they once had. They, have what they once had. The, the Russian army does have their professional soldiers armored troops, airborne troops, uh, troops, troops, you know, uh, the troops that, uh, and the artillery too, these are specialists. However, they tried to fashion their, they watched the United States in the Persian Gulf uh, one war. They watched the United States in the Iraq war. If you remember the United States, you know, General Tommy Franks, wanted over 200,000 men. And Rumsfeld says, you ain't getting them. You're not getting them. And they went with an invasion of about 130,000 men. And they ripped right through the Iraqi army. But what happened after that? The insurgency. The, Soviet, the Russians watched this. And unlike the, United States, unlike the United States and Iraq, remember that terminology, shock and awe? That's not what the Russians did here when they invaded Ukraine. I think part of that is because since Western press goes all over the world, they don't wanna be seen as butchers. 
not like the United States was in Iraq. Let's, let's understand this. Is he going to have to bring more weight to bear? Yes, he is. Putin's going to have to do that. The question here is, can he? You know, one third, one quarter to one third of the Russian army are conscripts. Now the, Russian, now, the Russians draft every year twice, two times a year. They draft April 1 to July 15. They draft again October 1 to December 31st. And they, they, the, Russians, the Russians have a manpower pool every year of about 800,000, a million, maybe 1.2. And in each draft session, twice a year, each session, they get anywhere from 120 to maybe 150,000 men. And these men are going to have a basic training for one month to two months. Then they might get advanced training depending on the depending on where they're going to be applied so that might make another month to two months these enlistments are for a year they're for a year but this was basically for defense now you are using these guys on the offensive the point being here if this war goes on for four months six months eight months, 10 months, 12 months. Is there going to be a backlash from home? Is there going to be a backlash from home? Because the invasion doesn't seem like it's going to schedule here. And I'm going to give you another historical parallel. The Winter War, November 30, 1939, when the Soviets invaded Finland. Keep in mind, Finland was actually part of the Tsarist Russian Empire from 1807 to 1917. They bolted with the collapse of Tsarist Russia. Stalin got territory between October 5 and October 10, 1939 from Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. He wanted to, he wanted to put troops on the coast of those countries. He didn't trust his German ally, <laughs> a wise foreign policy. He wanted territory out of, Ukraine, out of, out of Finland. Finland said no. So the Soviets attacked on November 30, 1939. They attacked with 30 divisions. The Finns had nine. Now, interesting, their railroads ran from north to south. And this is in the winter. The Finns used the railroads to move those nine divisions back and forth, back and forth to cut off Soviet spearheads and annihilate them in those wintry forests. This was an embarrassment for Stalin. This is a distinct embarrassment. So he brings in a new commander. His name was Semyon Timoshenko, who dealt, who shuffled the cards and dealt again. And he, and he had an access to manpower, upwards of 1.2 million men, tanks, guns, and they brought up 3,000 aircraft. By March 13, 1940, the Finns gave up. It was the Soviet weight of numbers. That brought this conclusion, that brought around the conclusion. However, it was still an embarrassment. The Soviets law in 15 weeks lost 50,000 dead and 150,000 wounded in defeating the Finns. Now, is that going to be repeated here? That remains to be seen. That remains to be seen. And because up at this point here, so, so supposing they're, they're, so this, this, the, uh, the Russians are bringing up uh, Ramazan Katadrov in Chechnya is bringing in some, supposedly bringing in Chechens for the Russians. The Rosgardi of secu security troops, supposedly they are in Ukraine right now and they are occupying some of the, you know, like Kyrgyzstan and some of the towns they've taken. These are security troops. They are instituting you know, the, the, the police actions here in some of the towns. The Wagner Group. The Wagner Group are mercenaries. They are now being called the Liga Unit. And also, you've probably seen this in the papers, the possibility of 16,000 Syrian volunteers going here to fight for the Russians. In fact, some of the Syrian volunteers were brought by the Russians to Libya. This is a payoff. This is a payoff by Assad if this transpires for what the Russians did back in 2015, 2016 in Syria. I mean, they shored up Assad's, Assad's uh, Assad able to stay in power here. 
So it's going to be interesting to see where this goes in the coming weeks, because we're going to be into this for a little while, unless some sort of agreement is reached between, between Kiev and, uh, and Moscow, which I don't know if that's going to happen at this stage of the game. One more point, and I find this interesting with regards to Russia. They, when they invaded Afghanistan in 1979, and that war lasted till 1988, when the, Soviet, when the Soviets were evacuated. Unlike the United States, which poured in at one point, keep in mind, the United States at one point in the Vietnam War had 562,000 men in Vietnam. 562,000. Have we done that ever since? No. No, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, of course, things have changed. The Soviets in Afghanistan didn't put in any more than 642,000 men for the entire war. Soviet troops, conscripts, and rifle toters, they were there 18 months. Soviet officers there two years. The Soviets lost some 15,000 men dead and another 48, 49,000 wounded. But to show you how unmodern the Soviet army was at this stage of the game, interesting. Out of 642,000 men, the full amount of casualties was 469,685. 73% of the overall force were casualties. Most of those casualties are health issues. Get a load of this. 415,932 out of 642,000 men fell victim to disease. 115,308 had infectious hepatitis. 31,080 typhoid fever which leads you to the extent, how was hygiene practiced in the Soviet army in the 1980s? That never would have happened to a Western army. That's a fascinating aspect of this to be cognizant of. You know, we're talking about a country that was using the same syringes 12 times before they threw them out. You know, you wash them. So it's interesting here, uh, it's, it's, we'd have to ask the question here, is the same sort of thing afflicting the, the Russian army now. And also this stuff about them underestimating the Ukrainians. Yeah, they underestimated the Finns a bit. And I assume that's part of the problem here. They, are, they underestimated the Ukrainians. But it's interesting to see where this war is gonna go here at this point. And I think I've done enough. If anyone has any questions, comments, wants to add, delete, detract, whatever the case may be, why not? Why not? <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, uh, Mark. Um, we're going to take a break before we take questions. Um, and uh, f f for two things, uh, some descriptions, some announcements, and well, both basically for some announcements. Uh, Jean, would you like to to give some announcements of the of the um, so, uh, future meetings? Well, I would like to, but um, I think Raj might um, do it. Raj would do a better job of it because he's the only one that knows what he's going to do next week. Is that right, Raj? And I'm, oh, he's not sure himself. I don't think it's more or less true. So I'll be presenting a talk. Uh, uh, next Sunday, and is uh, its title is currently, and we might modify it. Uh, I'm still in the working, but is the present Ukraine-Russia conflict an imperialist war? Question mark. So that would be the title, um, or thereabouts, and it will examine the issue of the Ukraine-Russia war or Russian attack on Ukraine and, and uh, track it uh, 
uh, which most people in here know uh, now, it didn't start on the 24th of February. It's, it's long in the making. But my explanation here, I'm attempting to analyze it using uh, the current situation of capitalism and Leninist analysis of imperialist war. So that's what I'll be attempting to do uh, next Sunday. Thank you. And do we have any other information on future meetings at this point? Raj or Jean? Okay. I don't have, I don't have any other. Uh, okay. They well, are, they are, we're talking to people and, you know, by so, next time. So subsequent uh, meetings will be announced as they're prepared. Things are changing pretty fast um, around the world and and at uh, ICSS. Um, uh, and I'd like to also uh, uh, request a, uh, make a request for funds. You know, as we know, as I, I mentioned before, we're associated, we're sponsored by the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library. And we're, um, we, we provide some support for them and we would like to continue to do so. And we also have our own expenses for, for, for putting on these programs. So they're fairly modest, but we do need some funds. And I placed in the chat some information on how you can um, contribute. And there are, um, there, what, what, what we're particularly interested, would urge people to do is make small monthly regular contributions, which are relatively painless, but provide us with a regular income. So with that, um, uh, we're going to start the um, the uh, question and answer and comments. Um, as many of you know, you please raise your hands uh, on the um, in the uh, uh, reactions the reactions uh, button, and I'll uh, call on people in the order that they, that they entered. First will be Richard W, followed by Elazar, followed by Ro Roger. Go ahead, uh, Richard. Hey, Mark. Yes, sir, how are you? <laughs> Cold, <laughs> chill, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's a pretty good presentation. Uh, I, I, want, I have a bunch of notes here that I, I was uh, taking. Sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> so it occurred to me when you talked about the, the Russian artillery bombardment uh, in World War II, I, by contrast, apparently we're witnessing a, a kinder, gentler artillery, uh, use of artillery uh, this, this go round. Yeah, we sure are. Uh, they don't seem to be uh, leveling uh, places quite like they did against Germany. Um, there were a couple of things I, I was kind of wondering uh, that, you did, that you didn't talk about or didn't talk about in, in depth. One was uh, the hype, use of hypersonics. Um, it's, my contention is, is that um, is, uh, one of the reasons the United States is not getting more involved in this is because I think they're afraid that the hypersonic uh, weapons might be used against us. Uh, and I think that's something we should worry about. Uh, sec second thing is, uh, you, you mentioned this uh, this agreement between Ukraine and Russia. That's not going to do much good if it doesn't include uh, United States and NATO. I mean, uh, most most of the, if not all, the demands were centered around incurring, uh, ensuring uh, Ru Russia's security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, NATO. Right. Uh, and so, therefore, they have to be included in this in this agreement for it to be to be made. You know, to go anywhere. Um, the, um, the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, it seems to me that, that in this last century, we've seen a rise in, in military alliances, and in particular, um, the alliance is more as, as, much a, uh, uh, as much a product of, uh, or as much a, uh, a corporate interest. And that is to say that the NATO, uh, the NATO alliance is very much one of supplying weapons to uh, 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 to other to, to NATO, not, not only to NATO countries, but other countries as well. 
Uh, so in that sense, it's a, it's a military uh, it's a military corporation, if you will. Uh, its chief competitor being, of course, Russia. Uh, so I was wondering if you could, uh, but you know, talk about that. But also, uh, we you know we we seen NATO expand, and yet on the other side. We've seen the, the the Warsaw Pact, for example. I think it's now dissolved. Uh, so I, I, you know, there's sort of an asymmetry going on here uh, that you've seen. You know, U.S. forming military alliances, while you've seen the on the other side, these alliances seem to be dissolving. Um, uh, I guess that the the, uh, uh, the other thing I, that, that I noticed is it seems to me there's been a change in uh, ever since uh, George Bush the smarter. Um, there's been a change in, in, in military tactics, a uh, shift in, in U.S. military tactics. Uh, we've gone much more to the use of uh, the CIA, much more to special forces operations, much more to covert operations, drone warfare. Uh, and the uh, for what it's worth, I'm not saying I'm not saying yay or nay to this, but at least the Russians are out there. I mean, they you know they 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 put out there they they. They 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 put their their list of, of demands out there back in December and held off for about three months, uh, and then they then they said, well, if you know you're going to see something, and at least their actions are visible and they're they're, they're transparent, if you will. Uh, we don't we don't you know there's there's no symmetry in tactics in that respect. Okay, I'll shut up. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Well, yeah, you you said something here that really resonates with me because in that in that long history I'm writing on the history of Army aviation, mm -hmm. I'm on the Afghanistan chapter, and uh, the first chapter deals with the Soviets in Afghanistan, and I felt as a contrast I'll put the American experience in Afghanistan, and a lot of that's going to be on helicopters too. They both used them, but the fact of the matter is what you just mentioned about us being more technologically oriented. You saw that and after 9-11, Richard, when we went into Afghanistan, uh, you, as you mentioned, with CIA types and special forces, but who did most of the fighting? Right, the exactly. Northern Alliance. Yep. And what we did was air power backed them up and the Taliban collapsed in two months. By December, it was over. Now, when you take and, and what we did uh, by 2002, we're virtually getting out of Afghanistan. And who's taking over here? They're bringing in Europeans. Now, some of these Europeans were from what organization? NATO. Now, when you see why China would support Russia, they don't want NATO in Asia either. Right. So why don't we support the Russians here? You know, they'll support the Russians down to the last dead Russian. Chinese aren't doing the fighting. The other side of the coin here is when you were talking about the United States. Yes, you see this growing penchant of using technology instead of bodies. And what are they doing? They are divorcing the American public from foreign policy. Yes, exactly. Yep. And so Americans can't even pronounce the names of villages their fellow Americans are in, in a uniform, they can't even pronounce, they don't even know where they are. They don't even know where they are. So Americans themselves are being divorced by the by not only just the technology, but by the wielders of this technology. And so Americans, you think Americans wanna go fight in, in, in Ukraine? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. So does that, is, is, that an, is that an impediment for the United States? Yeah, it is. It is, it is. Okay, let's move on to Elazar. And please keep your questions short. Yeah, I'd like the last speaker. Um, Sorry. Good morning, Elazar. Good right. I, wanna, I wanna put this in the context that I was hoping in part we would deal with. That is, I characterize US NATO as imperialist provocateurs in that they promised Gorbachev if they would dissolve the war, and I'm ready to be corrected on the errors I make, okay? So I'm not stating it as engraved in stone. They promised Gorbachev that they would not expand NATO into the former Warsaw Pact countries. 
Instead, that's exactly what they did. They're carrying out the old Kennan line, George Kennan line of containing before it was Soviet Union, now it's Russia. On the other side is Russia. I do not characterize as imperialist, but as a regional power who lost a lot of its power. Therefore, my political position, not my military position, is to critically support Russia's military action, but totally disapprove of their political leadership. So it's a critical support in that they're contesting an imperialist provocation. That's my view that they kept. Now, part of the reason for the provocation may be that the U.S. wanted Russia and Germany to cancel this Nord Stream 2 deal, and which he mentioned. One a question to the speaker, which was excellent, by the way. I could hardly keep up with all the vast data there. Uh, I've read about Bagration is who was the developer of deep combat and what became of him and was he guilty of what he was charged of was he not <laughs> okay so that's it i so i i would like to hear anyone contesting that russia is imperialist because imperialism to lenin that's the definition i'm interested in is not being aggressive not invading not trading not plundering but a certain stage in development of monopoly capitalism. And on that basis, I give critical support to Russia. And so thank you very much for your presentation. It was crystal clear. Bye-bye. Part of the problem with, with, with the agreement you alluded to, Elazar, and, you, and, you, and you're, a lot of what you're saying is correct here. James Baker. James Baker made made, made the made that premise that the that the that the West would not spread NATO into Eastern Europe. Now, uh, the the Russia from the on the Russian side of this of this discussion, uh, West Germany had been a NATO power. East Germany had been part of the East Bloc. Now Germany's whole. That's the crux of this. Germany. That's the crux of this. Now Moscow knows at this at this juncture. That, in a, that a unified Germany will now be a NATO power. There's nothing they can do about that. They know that. They will, they will accept this begrudgingly, but they'll accept this. However, as we get out of the George Bush years, uh, guess where this is going to go? They're going to, and Bill Clinton will be, will be the man that will do this. Although George Bush indicated this as well, George Bush Sr. But Clinton is the man that, that's going to do this. George Kennan told them, George Kennan told Clinton, do not spread NATO into Eastern Europe. You are asking for a world of trouble. And what's happened since? Now, keep in mind, this is the same George Kennan that, yes, you are right. He came up with that doctrine of containment. But he was also against building NATO. He thought even then that's going to inflame a Soviet backlash. And what did the Soviets come out with by 1953? The Warsaw Pact. Now you got two armed camps facing off with each other. Kennan didn't quite agree with this. Kennan didn't quite agree. This is the same guy, Elazar, Elazar that's going to tell Kennedy and, 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 uh, and Johnson, don't go into Vietnam and get out of Vietnam. What happened with that one? You know, so so he was pretty perceptive, despite his some of his uh, pronouncements that turned some people off. <laughs> but he was correct on this. You know, you don't you don't want to inflame the Russians, contain them. Yes, but you don't want to inflame them because we're going to we're going to open up a can of worms here. Yeah, that can of worms is open now. That's a problem. That's a problem. OK, the next is the answer. Next is Roger Harris. Uh, sure, thank you. Answer. Hey, Roger, can I ask you a question? Yes. Are you bringing back the black hand? Your hand isn't yellow; it's 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 black. Um, the hand is is um dark, and that's because it's on a light background, so it doesn't. Oh, okay. Now, I thought you were bringing back the old Yugoslav black hand here. No. Um, <laughs> in any case, um, I have a different type of question for you. Uh, yes, so sir. thank you for your presentation. It was sweeping and, and comprehensive. Um, I kind of had a 
hustle to keep up with it. Um, so I, I have two questions now that I'd li like you, not, not, not even questions, but really topics that I'd like you to elaborate on. Um, and the first is the Finnish war. Um, the, could you tell us more about the Finnish war? Uh, not so much the uh, military aspects, but the strategic and geopolitical aspects. What was, why did the Soviet Union engage in that? How did that relate to World War II? And what was the, um, the outcomes in a geopolitical sense of the Russian effort in Finland? And then if you could bring that back to what, how that might apply to Ukraine now, I'd appreciate that. And maybe, maybe I'll, I'll save my second question because that's, a, that's a, a very comprehensive question. Uh, my, I'll, I'll save my second question for later. So th thank you, Mark. Yeah, you're welcome. The, the, you know, the, the, the Finnish war of 1939 comes on the heels of the, of the Hitler-Stalin uh, wiping off the map as an independent state, Poland. You know, you're, 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 you're seeing a whole change in the map of Europe in 1919 with the Versailles Treaty. Uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia had got, uh, were no longer parts of Tsarist Russia. Finland got out of Tsarist Russia. Uh, there, there, there is no more Tsarist Russia. There's no more, there's no more Austro-Hungarian Empire. There's Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, so on and so forth. We don't need to go into all that. But borders change. But on, and, and I wrote an article in World War II History Magazine on this back in 2016 on the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. I called it Pact of the Devils. And it's about 5,500 words. And in this agreement, you know, Churchill and, uh, Churchill and La Lloyd George are still alive, are pushing Neville Chamberlain to make a deal with the Soviets that summer of 1939 to prevent Hitler from marching into Poland. And he dragged his feet. He didn't want to make a deal with Moscow. And so Stalin will make a deal with Hitler on the night of August 23, 24, 1939. And it's called the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, had a lot of trade items in it, but that's the cake. The icing in the cake is that Hitler, to keep at peace the world's largest army, he didn't want that, he didn't want to go into combat with that army, the Russian <laughs> army, Soviet army, will divide Poland. And that's exactly what they're going to do. So September 1, Hitler marches into Western Poland on uh, September 17th. Stalin will march into Eastern Poland and they'll cut it in half and wipe it off the map as an independent state. However, you think Stalin trusts Hitler? No, he doesn't. So he's going to put the pressure on Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. I want territory here and I want to put troops on your territory, especially near the coast. And the, and the Baltic states will acquiesce. Now, Finland, they're going to, the, Moscow is going to put pressure on Finland. <clears throat> we want to move that border up the Karelian Isthmus away from, like, away, away from Leningrad or St. Petersburg today, if that's what you want to call it. We also want Hango on that southwest coast and put troop, 5,000 troops here to guard the mouth of the Gulf of Finland. Then we want the Fisherman's Peninsula or the Rabachi Peninsula, which is that uppermost part of Finland into the, into the Arctic Ocean. He wanted to put troops here. The Finns said, and they also wanted some islands in the Gulf of Finland. That's a few of the islands the Finns said you can have, but the rest of it, no. So the Russians went to war with the Finns. And they're going to have, and in the, in the beginning of the war, the Finns were great fighters. They were great winter fighters, great fighters in the forest. And they literally tore the Soviet formations apart. But the Soviets are going to bring great weight to bear, especially 3,000 aircraft. And they're going to dominate the skies and they're going to dominate the war. And the Finns have to sue for peace. The war is over with. The geostrategic importance of this, Roger, is the following fall of 1940, when Hitler makes a diplomatic blitz in the Balkans and Moscow is livid because there are Slavs who live in the Balkans and Vyacheslav Molotov is gonna go to, is gonna go to, uh, to, to Germany in, in November uh, in, the, in October of 1940, and there he's going to have a discussion with Hitler, and Finland comes up, 
And he says to Hitler, he tells Hitler, uh, you make friends with the Finns and the people from Finland come to Germany and people in Germany go to Finland. And he says, the Finns threaten our security. We're going to have to do something about that. And he told and Molotov told Hitler to his face, we are going to do something about that. And Hitler exploded. I understand you too well, Molotov. You want to wage war against the Finns. And he says, do you want you understand me? That's out of the question. Now, the important part of this is Hitler is getting 45% of his iron ore from Sweden. So if the Stalin can take Finland, is that a threat? Is, is Hitler going to consider that a threat to his Swedish shipments of iron ore? Yes. Yes. Interesting scenario going on here with Finland by Hitler and Stalin at the time. So where does that go into World War II? Well, obviously, the, the, the Soviets won't take control of Finland. And Hitler is going to urge the Finns when he attacks uh, the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 41. He's going to urge the Finns to launch a large offensive down the Karelian Isthmus to take Leningrad. And you know what the Finns are going to say? No, they'll go, they'll go south, but they're not going to attack Leningrad. And I think the Finns understand that maybe Hitler might not win this war. And if he doesn't win this war, what are the Soviets going to do to us? And they want no part of this. Interesting, interesting, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dynamics here in 1939, 1940, and again in 1941 between Germany, Finland, and the Soviet Union. Fascinating. It truly is. Okay, next question is from Gene, followed by Raj. Good day, oh. Gene. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark. This was very interesting and informative. Oh, it's a um, lot of fun. And a lot of fun also. And, you know, we do have also housed at the uh, Marxist Library, the Friedrich Engels study of uh, mili military tactics, I think, with Al Sarge's. But he, mm -hmm. he does not Zoom. He's, one of, he's kind of old school on that. But um, and I'm kind of old school myself, I guess. But um, I, I, again, I have a little bit different perspective here. Um, I, one thing I know, Marx is uh, reputed to reputed to have said to uh, Fred Engels, so uh, talking about the Civil War, saying, "Fred, you spend too much time on the purely military aspects here." And Marx, you know, said, "What would be the effect of a battalion of Negro soldiers?" Or, and Marx himself did a lot of uh, solidarity work to make sure Engels, that the British textile owners did not side with the, with the South on this. So uh, these other aspects are important. And uh, I, I'm uh, a member of Veterans for Peace and our organization uh, stands for the abolishment of war. That's our right. mission. And uh, I'm, um, and at one point, sometime uh, in the past, and I'm thinking of doing it again, is I did something on the abolishment of war from an anthropological and uh, Marxist point of view, because as you know, Marx uh, says that after the transformation uh, of uh, society, um, war and the state will uh, join the spinning wheel in the Museum of Antiquities. <laughs> and I find that a very good um, summary, and I think it's worth worth considering. Um, the the other thing is, you know, in in the Ukraine and this whole situation there. Oh, I'll just also say, most of us uh, us uh, us in Vets for Peace, we have every we we had a long discussion on this in our chapter meeting, and we were all convinced that uh, you know. Biden and U.S. And, uh, could end this war within hours with a simple phone call. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the back that. Pardon? I would agree with that. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the backdrop for the war. This is a war that the United States is fighting by proxy mm -hmm. uh, and it's making them a lot of money, but it's not something, you know, that we should, United States, our military, you know, our slogan is bring our troops home, U.S. out of Eurasia and abolish NATO. 
And so those are the kinds of views that we hold on this and that we bring to that. Um, so I, I think that's a crucial thing to understand here in terms of, uh, uh, we, I don't think any, certainly I don't condemn uh, Putin for what he's doing. I blame the United States uh, for our foreign policy. We should not be involved in there at all. Um, and I think that's the backdrop for how we should be looking at this. Um, I would probably have more to say, but I'll, I'll stop there and come back later. But again, thank you for raising all these issues, provocative and informative. And thank you. You're welcome, Gene. Well, one part of this, when you get back to Biden, uh, if you had Hillary Clinton here, uh, Gene, it wouldn't be any different because what's Joe Biden? He's Hillary Clinton without a dress. Uh, I, I, what he is. No, I mean, I mean, he brought he brought Victoria Nuland into into his uh, into his entourage, didn't he? She's under Secretary of State. Uh, and so, right. and so, the, and so the, you can still have Gene, my fair lady. You can still alter the cast a little bit, but it's still my fair lady, isn't it? Absolutely right. Right. And that's why I like, like to watch Tucker Carlson uh, in my spare time. Anyway, again, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Raj, go uh, ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Very... By you, Yusuf and Ann Lewis. Okay, Mark, thank you very much. You did not disappoint us. It was a very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, materialist, uh, materialism based. I like that a lot, although not a Marxist one particularly, but I was very close, so I appreciate it. But I want to make three comments and then a question, okay? It is a clarification. Uh, Roger's question on, on Finland, I just wanted to add that uh, Stalin did offer land swap to Finland for, for the the part of land they wanted uh, control on so that the Germans would not be able to get to uh, Leningrad so fast. Right. Russia actually offered bigger land uh, up north. Finland refused. So that's one thing I just wanted to know. And uh, about the 1931, I think earlier you maybe said it by slip of tongue and a lie, the Russians and the Germans were certainly not allies. You corrected later on saying that there was, it was a non-aggression pact, but each one knew they are the enemies, sworn enemies of each other. Oh, of course, that's a, that's a marriage of yeah. convenience. Just, just clarification, yeah. And then about the Poland. Now, uh, my understanding from Grover is that the Russians recovered that piece of land from Poland that Poland had seized in the 1919 Russo-Polish uh, Pol Russo Russo -Polish Russian -Polish War, which in which Poland prevailed and took some land and that included parts of Ukraine too. So uh, I just want you to make comment about because I my understanding from Grover is a little different. And then I finally come down to this Russian offensive on Ukraine. I think uh, the Western press and Western media in general are calling the failure and weak and all that. But when I look at the Indian media and their military, retired military senior officers analyzing it, who studied this, all kinds of things also in their career, uh, Stalingrad and others, they're saying, no, it is not. What uh, they're saying is the Russians are using softer tactics because they want to be able to have some influence in Ukraine. And one of them pointed out that the bombing was only one day long, whereas the Americans bombed Iraq for 40 consecutive days, heavy bombing. So the Russians played soft, now they're intensifying. And uh, the big question associated with that, so I just want you to comment on that. The big question on that is uh, this denazification goal. Yeah. It, how is this? I don't see how it can be achieved without occupation. And, and Putin knows very well the occupation doesn't go well. So any thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the Stalin, the Stalin, the Stalin and Stalin and Finnish thing. Yeah, the, the, the Soviets were going to give uh, the Finns some worthless territory up north of Leningrad. But the, so the, the Finns didn't want that territory. 
Uh, they just didn't want to go with that at all. Number one, it would have extended their border and made it, it made it probably more, more palatable for the Soviets to attack inside Finland itself. So they didn't want to have any, they didn't want any part of this, not at all. Uh, Poland after the First World War. Uh, this kind of resonates with me because I call the Versailles Treaty the biggest fraud ever perpetrated on modern man, and it is. It you know when 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 they when the, the the French were the ones that were really hot to trot here to resurrect Poland. The British, yeah, but they the, it's the French. Why? Because the French wanted to build that buffer between them and this fledgling Bolshevik state. Now this isn't any different, Raj. That when you go back to eighteen five. When Napoleon destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, he put together the German Confederation of 16 German states. Why? It's a buffer to Tsarist Russia. So what you're seeing in 1805, 186, <laughs> the French are resurrecting here in 1919. Interesting, it's the same power. And you're directing it against basically the same nation. Tsarist Russia, Bolshevik Russia, it's Russia. And so it's interesting how history repeats. It's not exactly the same, but it repeats. But Poland is not going to be satisfied with what they're getting at Versailles. They want more. So they're going to invade in the 1919-1921 Russo-Polish War. They're going to invade Ukraine. And of course, as they're advancing east, they're slaughtering Jewish people by the bushel. Who needs them? However, Trotsky's Red Army is going to stop them at Kiev, and then they're going to push them back. Now they are going to. Have, there's going to. They, the, the the Red Army is going to get into Poland, but of course the British and the French are going to throw the Poles weapons, and the Poles will throw them back. Yes, Ukraine did lose some territory, and Stalin's going to get some of this some of this territory back in 19, 1939. One of the reasons he makes the deal with Hitler. He makes that, but again, we're talking about an area where there are numerous border changes. And I don't care what anybody says. There are going to be people in some of these countries, gee, remember when we had that territory and they're going to want it back. You can't tell me there aren't Germans that don't want East, East Prussia back. Or some Mexicans who cross the border here who want Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Colorado, and Utah back. I mentioned that just a few days ago, Raj, and some lady sitting in the back had her waving her hand like, like, like it was going to fall off. And she says, I said, yes. She says, well, they can keep Texas. <laughs> you know, but there are people who remember these changes and it's handed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. So, and the Rus Russian soft approach, you mentioned that. Yes, I also think that's the help keep the help to keep the Western media sedate compared to how it is now. You know, the United States didn't have to be concerned with that because the newspapers covering the, the invasion of Iraq came from where? The United States, Europe, especially England. England's the 51st state anyway. So what do you, how do you think their press is going to cover this? Unless it's the Guardian, maybe perhaps. And so, but not so with Russia. Putin has to watch his step. But the question is, how long is he going to do this? Now, as far as denazification, don't think Putin does not have intelligence organs already in Western Ukraine because of the fact you could wind up with an insurgency here. You know, like the Phoenix program in South Vietnam where we were assassinating leaders of the, of the VC. Don't think he does not do, he don't think he won't do the same thing. And I say that because if I was in Moscow and I was him, I would. I would. You know, you cut off the snake, the body dies. That's, that's how it works in theory in that type of game. You know, you're talking about the espionage intelligence counter counterinsurgency game, and that's a dirty game to play. A very dirty game to play. Very dirty. Okay. We have quite a few um on the on the stack now. So uh, moving along, Yusuf, followed by Anne and Norma. Uh, Hello, uh, Yusuf. Hi, hi, sorry for being late. Um, in, um, very good presentation, Marco Pasha. So um, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and uh, we, we, oh, we one point in Finland uh, 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 after World War One. Well, it, it was once uh, originally part of uh, uh, in, in Imperial uh, Russia. Right. And, uh, and it, uh, uh, after the revolution, it declared uh, itself independent, but uh, also very virulently anti-communist. Um, uh -huh. uh, so there's that factor. Yep. Um, uh, second, uh, to March 12th, I think, was the anniversary of the Truman do Doctrine. So maybe uh, a few comments on that is in order. Um, as far as the present military situation is concerned, I think it's uh, uh, pretty uh, consistent with what was seen in Syria. Uh, a, a, there was a heavy uh, aerial bombardment take out the um, uh, uh, established air superiority. But then served, it, it take it very easy uh, when it, it comes to capturing cities. Like Aleppo was surrounded for months uh, before uh, 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 being taken from the, uh, uh, um, uh, the um, well, mostly uh, extremist uh, Islamic rebels. Uh, so uh, I think I, I find this uh, quite consistent, although they did advance quite um, uh, rapidly in, uh, in north of Crimea, which is, a, is a, for uh, in, in the Russian point of view, quite important to right. consolidate uh, Crimea. So I, and, and anyway, uh, Marco Pasha, do, do you have any uh, and? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure Mehmet recognizes that uh, name, uh, so um, go ahead. Well, yeah, yeah, you're you're right about the Russians in southern Ukraine. Uh, the idea would be to get to Odessa and cut off uh, Ukraine from the sea, make it landlocked, make it landlocked. You know, Putin's wish list here would probably be at the very least to get to the Dnieper River and sever this country in half. And the reason being that that would turn Western Ukraine into a rump state. But again, like Stalin understood in 1939, 1940, and again, 1945, you don't wanna be invaded. You gotta push that border further west. So the idea here is to push that border further west because if the Ukrainians are gonna dicker around about NATO, uh, Putin's not gonna dicker around about this. And besides, Many of, the, many of the people who are r more Russian affiliated are in the East. So supposedly an occupation would be, would be easier here. But of course too, you know, Western Ukraine is where a lot of the, a lot of the ardent nationalists are. And they, they don't like Russians, they don't like Poles, uh, they, 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 they don't like them. Uh, and there's historical reasons as to why. Uh, but here, uh, but here, yes, and you're right about the Russians surrounding cities and not occupying them. Of course, in Syria, uh, the, the Russians, like, like the United States and Afghanistan in the beginning of the Afghan war in 2001, they didn't do, a, they didn't do as much of the fighting as maybe uh, the Syrian army did, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, the, Ira the, Iranian, the Iranian guards did, revolutionary guards. Uh, and some of the and some of the Afghans, some of the Afghan orphans who grew up and the Iranians trained to be part of the Iranian guard, uh, were, uh, were 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 brought here as well, and also put into Lebanon, by the way, to fight the Israelis. And so, could that? And this is what I mentioned earlier about you know, and you saw the news reports: sixteen thousand uh, Syrian troops could be put into Ukraine here. Uh, that, that's been spoken of. Are they going to do it? That remains to be seen here. That remains to be seen. But a lot of this was, the, was Russian air power covering for the Syrians. We haven't seen an overpowering amount of Russian air power yet in Ukraine. We haven't seen that yet. Are we going to see it? Maybe. It depends on where this war goes. But Putin's going to have to make up his mind soon, Yosef because we are getting well into March now and the thaw starts and it's gonna be hard to move tanks 
in places where the ground is no longer hard and becomes very mushy. That remains to be seen. And with regards to Truman, yeah, the, tr the, the Truman Doctrine uh, of containing of containing uh, of the, 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 the Soviet Union. And that some of, some of this is based off of uh, George Kennan. You know, you, you don't want to get involved in another war like 1939-45, that the United States should use its superior economy. It's, it was considered back then a more palatable political alternative to the Soviet system, our intelligence, our propaganda, and stay out of big wars. You're going to get the occasional brush fire wars, Kennan said, but you are going to, but you want to contain them because we will outlast them. That was Kennan's agenda, and Truman's gonna bite on this. That's what he's gonna do. Interest, interesting, what's going, interesting what's going on here in the, after, the, after 1945. It's fascinating. Uh, okay, next question is from Ann Lewis, followed by Norma. Okay, so this is Hello, from Ann. Texas. Hi, good morning. This is from Texas. Ah, you just alluded to us. The Independent <laughs> Republic of Texas? Well, no, the place of border wars. We'll think of it ah. that way. Um, uh, ongoing. But anyway, um, I had, I know it's really hard to predict the future, even when it's fairly soon. Um, but I, I had two questions. One was you alluded to one phone call. What would that phone call be that would end this from us? And second of all, um, I mean, what would the content be? And then second of all, how does this end? What's the end game here? I, I really don't get it. One phone call? If Bush talked to Putin, let's say? Uh, well, we won't spread NATO, but you get your you get your behind out of our, out of Ukraine. Now, Putin's also going to bring up, well, what about the oil and gas pipelines? That might be more of an issue than Ukraine itself, uh, because oil and gas pipelines mean what? Money, and that means the American dollar. What's one of the major reasons the dollar is still the world's reserve currency? Because oil is generally priced in what? The dollar. That's 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 non-negotiable. Keep in mind why we why we invaded Iraq. You know we never talk about this. <laughs> in two thousand, Saddam took Iraq's oil transactions off the dollar and put them on the euro. That's a death sentence. That's a death sentence. Iran has made normal has made has made uh, uh, you know noises along these lines. Why do you think? You know, and that's another thing. Uh, our press getting into you know, comparing this with the Iranian situation about surrounding Ukraine with with Russian military forces. What did the United States do in the 90s and into the 21st century with Iran? Weren't there numerous military bases around the Iranians? <laughs> you know, do as I do, but not, you know, don't do as I do, but do as I say, right? It's not the same thing. But that phone call could probably, uh, like it was alluded to earlier, you know, yeah, okay, we won't spread NATO in Eastern Europe. But then, but then comes the conversation what is the, what do the Russians have to give up to get that? Pipelines to Europe? They need that. They need that for their economy, right? Although let's understand something about Putin. Putin over the past 10, 12, 15 years has hoarded gold like China has. They've also been hoarding hard currency. He supposedly has over $650 billion of this stuff. Now, does that give them a little breathing space? Yeah, does. It does. Forever? No. No. But that one phone call would have to include getting out of, out of Ukraine, but also no NATO in Eastern Europe. But then again, would Putin be able to control the politics in Kyiv if he gets out of Ukraine? That's, a, that's another question. OK. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Norma Harrison. Well, I wonder if Ann Hello, had Norma. Any... Hello. Hello, Mark. It's great to hear you always see you. I wondered if Ann had satisfactory exchange about her questions. 
Um, well, the one thing I uh, didn't hear Mark's answer to, because I really respect what you have to say in your understanding of history, is where's the end game here? How does this thing wind down? How do we get, how does this happen? Well, man never got off the merry-go-round. He still makes war. You know, remember Georg Hegel, the German philosopher, war is change, peace is stagnation. You don't think there isn't truth to this? You know, war is man's locomotive of change. Although climate change might be a competitor now, Mother Nature. Maybe that's where it's going. But, you know, the, the idea, and I mentioned this earlier, the, the idea of the quest for resources and financial domination, the great game, more than two centuries, it's still being played, Anne. It's still being played. And Ukraine won't be the last round. This isn't the 15th round of a championship fight. This is round 3,583. And we're going to be going on the 3,584. That seems to be the penchant of man. You know, and I understand what Roger was saying earlier about abolishing war. That'd be nice. It's been tried. But does, well, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that's going to happen immediately. But what is going to happen in our immediate future? How are immediate we? Immediate future? Well, this war will come to an end, just like, just, or come to a conclusion, not an end. It will come to a conclusion, like they all do. But what are the results of the war? Will it lead to another conflict? I, I disbelieve people who say, "Well, Putin's next stop is Poland. He doesn't have the economy for this." And he's not going to invade Poland. He can't. He can't. But what's going to happen with, let's, let's say, a fractured Ukraine? What does that lead to? Does that lead to a rump state in Western Ukraine? Is that what's going to happen here? Are, are the gloves off and, and NATO is going to move into Western Ukraine? Which is not what Putin would want. Is that a guarantee of a, of, of a continued difference of opinion, if you want to call it that? Sure is. Sure. Is. There are too many balls in the air here to juggle. So a, a, so a conclusion or a ceasefire, what's, what, what, what's going to be the attributes of that? Okay. No. Interesting. Okay. 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 Um, Norma, did you have a question on your own? Of another question? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, this whole thing is about the Soviet revolution. This whole thing is about the victory of the mind of the people, which is huge throughout, not just uh, people in Russia who still feel this way, but throughout the world where uh, socialist and communist attempts and efforts have been being crushed one after another in order to maintain the ownership by our present owners um, and their and their heirs into infinity. I've put up a uh, an address, uh, 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 an email, an internet address for uh, the timeline in Afghanistan is w which is kind of what clued me into this. The war, the war in Afghanistan. It started in 1953. Mm -hmm. A good, a good comrade uh, informed me of that way long ago, and of course, I just opened mouth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> uh, the the embattlement is to suppress and wipe out the idea that people can control their sovereignty their whatever however they arrange their resources whether they're imports exports or within the countries uh, that people have an understanding now that communism is an alternative and the objective of getting there is pretty difficult but it's that objective being difficult has been being knocked down now for quite a few years so little by little Oh, I read this interesting thing. When I start to talk about uh, the advance of the socialist struggle, I can name uh, South American, Central American countries, um, 
I cannot name African countries. So I, I went to the uh, Britannica and it says that in Africa, in about 1925, one country after another attempted to establish a self-governance behavior. And of course, those all got wiped out by the colonizers with their brutality and so forth. So right. uh, people have the attitude that those are good things. And the fact that it's grown into people's minds has to be wiped out in order for the owning class to continue to own our labor, the, the land, uh, the, the governance of control of the features of our lives that uh, can, by which we can liberate ourselves. I'm waiting for a bit of a, uh, a change like Hugo Chavez's. <laughs> Hugo Chavez went from not being communist to being communist. And uh, I'm waiting for that to be allowed to uh, Vladimir Putin. I think that uh, he's susceptible to that. Okay, I please. I think he. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Let me. I think that he's a kind. Uh, a kind leader, and he's very. And he's going to be more and more impressed with his ability to lead the people toward what they want or to follow the people better is what they said about Hugo Chavez. He learned to follow the people. I mean, you, you said something earlier about, about Marxism and social, about communism and socialism. In the, in the United States right now, uh, especially with some of the young, socialism is no longer a dirty word. Uh, the reason, be, one of the big reasons, and I, I think this is, this is true with people who were born from 1997 on. People born in 1997 are what, 25 years old now? Uh, some of them are saddled with student loan debt. Some of them can't buy health insurance. Some of them can't, some of them can't get a job. They graduated they, with, with a degree they graduated from, from, high, from, uh, from college. Uh, all they know is 9-11, the 2002 national security strategy, the Iraq war, the 2007 financial meltdown, the, 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 the 2010 Citizens United, uh, the the assault on the on on the on the on the, on the, on the on civil rights, the assault on the on on, a, on voting rights, uh, the advent of the Trump administration, and also the the Sanders phenomenon, the anti-establishment backlash. This is all they know. They don't know. They don't know an America that existed 50 years ago because they didn't live or 60 years ago they didn't live in it when the Republic was still functioning to a certain extent. They don't know this. That's all this is, all they know is what I just listed and even more. That's what they know and they don't like it. And they don't like the fact that the previous generations are gonna leave them a debt they're gonna have to pay off. And yet the same ruling class wants them to go fight in Iraq, Afghanistan, Af uh, Syria, so on and so forth. And you're gonna see in your, and so Amer a lot of these Americans don't wanna fight anymore. They don't want to go anymore. Yeah, they don't want to go, and so, you know, the the, the where where's the country going to go at this stage? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Watch the young. I I was born in nineteen thirty five. Nineteen thirty five. You were born in thirty five. Yes. Okay. Thank you, and um, um, I, I I've been a communist by birth all my life. Three generations. Um, wow. I just, b before we go into the second round, I just want to make a comment on this uh, too. Um, you know, on the economic aspect of the struggle, which is actually between uh, socialist China and to some extent socialist Russia, they, those two countries have basically been subsidizing the West, uh, the capitalist countries. They've been exchanging their commodities, manufactured commodities and, uh, uh, and uh, natural resources for basically worthless um, uh, paper, paper dollars, not completely worthless, but now they've become worth and paper euros because the, the um, 
the sanctions make them worthless. And this is going to end now. This subsidizing of the of the, the capitalist countries is ending. It may not happen right away with, with um, China, but it's happened now with Russia. The, the West will no longer get um, um, oil and gas and raw materials from Russia unless they have something to offer in exchange. And it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be paper euros or paper dollars. They're going to have to be able to offer real things, and which they can't do. They can to some extent, but this is a this is a game changer geopolitically. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it right there. Uh, if, if, of course, if Mark, you want to, if you want to comment, go ahead. Yeah, one one of the th one of the things that gets me here is is is, and, and I hear this a lot. That well, you know, China knocked out Japan as the world's number two economic power. They're now they're now number two. Japan's number three, and yet now they're they're pouring some of their money into their military. I said, well, they're just following the American example. You know, when we were the world's leading economic power, we began to devote resources to the military. Why? That was part of the that was part of the agenda of spreading the American agenda. I said, but I said what. I said, I, but I tell you know these particular people. I tell what you don't seem to get, or you don't, or you don't want us, you don't want to mention, is that China holds at least a trillion dollars of our debt, and I so you have to pay the interest on that debt. So instead of complaining about China spending money on the military, then when you pay, when when you pay the interest on that debt, guess where some of that money can go to, building up the Chinese military. So I said, you're not mm -hmm. only funding your own military, you're helping to fund China's too. I said, so, so, so what, what's, so when I hear this discussion about land based in China, I said, you are supporting this. Well, of course, the United States is not good for its debt in the end. It won't pay it. And, and, uh, and money doesn't buy anything. Doesn't, that, that you can't, you can't create a military from, from money. You have to have the productive resources to do it. Well, of and course that's you what, do. Of course well, you do. Yeah. But America, but America is applying a lot of its industrial capacity to doing what? Weapons. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving right doing. along. Um, uh, Richard W. Followed by Raj and Gene and Tra. Well, I'm going. To, uh, may, may I just noticed Trahan was not who raised the questions earlier. Yeah, you he hasn't spoken ahead. yet. What? He hasn't spoken yet. Right. So I'm going to ask Trahan uh, to, to unmute himself and ask a question. Okay. <clears throat> well, it's good day, it's sir. Quite a comment. I got relatives that live in Kharkiv and Kiev, my mother's side. And I've been getting letters uh, in Kharkiv. It's uh, there's no water, there's no heat. The windows have been blown out from the concussions of explosions. They're not getting any money, um, and they're drinking water out of a stream near a church. And they live in a very the heart of uh, Kharkiv in Kiev. Uh, some of them are under a clinic with their kids in a cellar, and the other one, my one that all well, would pick me up, he's went into the army. So who knows if he's going to be alive? But anyways, I went to a uh, peace demonstration last week when they had the national one uh, and I got interviewed by a local TV and I told them I've been communicating with them. And also I said in their letter, do not send weapons, send humanitarian aid. And then I said, they don't want to see, this is my saying, they do not want to see Ukrainians fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian. And that also, Ukraine should be declared neutral. The local televisions put part of that in. They censored that out about the weapons and uh, fighting Ukraine to the last Ukrainian. You know, so there was a censorship there. That really kind of made me angry because they had in their letter, they don't want to see more weapons go there, which Biden is pushing. So it's just going to turn Ukraine into Afghanistan. That's what they want to do. They want to kill as many people. They don't care how many Russians they kill. 
just for geopolitical purposes. So that's my statement. Thank you. No, I concur with that. I mean, again, going back to resources and financial domination leads to political domination. It's it's the great game that's going on here. And so, do you, and so, do you think? And so, so do you honestly think that that that? I mean, how many how many peace conferences are going on every day at the Lockheed board, <laughs> or Boeing, or Raytheon? You know, they're, 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 you think do you think they're having peace conferences here? You think they're discussing? No, they, they won't. They're not going to do that. That it, that 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 unhinges the bottom line. You know, as, as Smedley Darlington Butler said, what war is a racket. Remember that book? Yeah. So it is. Okay. It is. OK, Richard W. Also from Texas. Also from Texas. Yeah. A great independent state thereof. There's someone else who hasn't spoken. Oh, I can defer. Susan. I don't see. A, I don't see. A... Susan and or um, Michael. I'll defer. I don't see a hand up for. It is. And now there's Keith. Now I see Keith. Now I see Susan and Keith. Okay. Sorry, Richard. Uh, you you. You're, you're back in the line. Susan. Hi, every, hi everybody. Um, thanks, Mark. A very interesting talk. Oh, you're um, welcome. I would like you and others to characterize the class nature of Russia. We have Maybe that's going to happen next week, but I'd like a taste of it now because some people are saying that Russia is continuing a socialist path. Thank you. Well, you still have your class of oligarchs here. I mean, the war itself is capitalist versus capitalist. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you're seeing here. Now, are, are, are all the people are all the people oligarchs here? No, of course not. Are the mass the mass are the mass are workers, the mass are middle the, the well, fledgling middle class, but people that the but the people themselves are at the whim of the oligarchs like they are here there's really not much of a difference at this stage of the game there's really not that much of a difference and so russia you know with with the collapse of the soviet union and let's understand something too i mean some of the soviets knew how to count their money you know they knew how to count their money uh but here putin coming out of that system uh you know has allied himself with the oligarchs why because he had to he had to, you know, it's like Japan, you know, Japan is run by what? Six industri highly industrialized families. Don't they run Japan in the end? Yeah, it's part of, it's part, somewhat of a corporate state. That's where this went. And so interesting in, in Russia, uh, however, let's understand something. Isn't the communist party rated number two or three among the parties in Russia. So have so has everybody forgotten 19 not you know 1917 apparently not everybody. So do, so do, does that create a possible issue here for Putin? Yes it does. Yes it does. So keep your eyes on where this war goes. Keep your eyes on what Susan on what I mentioned before about the conscript soldiers. If this war goes on a while, could you see a repeat of what you saw in 1989? Let's understand something here about, about the Afghan war that, 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 that the Russians fought. You know, they lost about 15,000 dead, give or take a couple of hundred either way. But according to the CIA, upwards of 1.3 million Muslims died fighting the Soviets. And they won the war. They won this war, but they also fought the last battlefield action that led to the end of the Cold War. That is not even on the table for discussion in this country. Because why? They're Muslims. Interesting turn of events here. You know, we must acknowledge that they, we didn't fight the last battlefield action of the Cold War or what you call the Cold War, the Muslims.
Muslims did. They did. And they paid heavily for this. I mean, heavily. You don't believe me? Contact the National Security Archives. The CIA will tell you this. Okay. That's what I did. We, we have two more uh, people who haven't um, uh, questioned yet, Keith and Sharon. And then we're going to wind up the recorded part of our, our meeting today, and it'll be more informal. So Keith, go ahead and let's keep it brief. Just a very brief question. Uh, what is your estimate of the capabilities of the Ukrainian army? Well, they obviously, they obviously don't have the, capa uh, the cap capabilities that the Russians do. They don't, they, don't, they don't have the amount of aircraft. They don't have the amount of artillery. They don't, they don't have the modern equipment. However, what they do have is something the Russians don't have and that the Russians had in 1941. They're the defending team and they have that emotional nationalism that, that led the Soviets to win this war in, by 1945. That's what the Ukrainians seem to have. And how that plays into this uh, depends a lot on how the Russians affect the rest of this war. Now, I'm not saying the Ukrainians are going to win, the, the, win this on the battlefield. What I am saying is, and this is not beyond the realm of, 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 of this is not, this is beyond the realm of impossibility. It's totally possible. A uh, long insurgency getting the Russians stuck in something that maybe they didn't think they would be stuck in. Now that didn't happen in the winter war of 1939, March, 1940, but that doesn't mean it's not gonna happen here. It's not gonna happen here. I mean, some of okay. these Ukrainians are highly, and I mean highly nationalistic. And so are they gonna, so do they wanna be taken over? They, you know, the, the Soviet Union collapsed in recent memory. And so, and, so, and so when you see the collapse of the Soviet Union, it's no longer one nation. Now, you as a map maker now have to draw 16 new countries. And so we're, we're, gonna, so we're gonna see where that's gonna go. But however, can, but the, can this Ukrainian army stand up to the Russian army? I mean, one of the reasons the, Rus the, the Russians are doing as bad as they are is probably because the Russians themselves, not the Ukrainians, not the Ukrainians. The Russians themselves, you know, it's almost like the Rush, the, Yugos, the 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 Ukrainians can't win this, but the Russians can lose it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, um, that, we need to, that remains to be seen. The next question is from Sharon, and the last question, actually. Well, I just, hi, I just have a few comments. Thank you very much for your talk, Mark. Um, I just have a few comments on some of the things that people have said in this discussion. Uh, the first is about China. So I, don't, I look at what's go, what, the Chinese relationship to the United States a li little bit differently. China owns a lot of American uh, bonds, that is to say debt, and, but they can, they have the power to divest themselves anytime they want of the, that debt. They can put it on the open market they can sell it. And what I think that represents is a, um, that is to say that the Chinese ownership of that debt represents the Chinese working class supporting the lifestyle of the American working class. It's not just supporting the American military uh, investment, but I, I, I think they can stop it whenever they want to. Um, I, I wanted to say, make a comment about the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. So they're one of several different, of several communist parties in Russia, but, I, and I don't know enough about it, but I, should, I would just comment that the Communist Party of the Russian Federation has, has people in the parliament, has quite a big, uh, relatively large, um, contingent in the parliament, and they have up to now supported what um, the Russia, Russia is doing. They, their website is often often lags. I mean, their English, I should say, their in, English website is often lags what they're actually doing. But um, 
looking at their website, they, they support, supported uh, Putin's invasion um, and talked a lot about denazification. Right. I, I don't know what the other two parties are doing. Um, and the, I think that it's wrong to say that Russia is still socialist. It's been a long time <laughs> and that th these uh, oligarchs have been in power. And the Russian economy is, is, is distorted. It's not being developed in a whole, an all-sided way. It relies heavily on the export of, of oil and gas and um, to whose benefit. So I think it's on its way to becoming a capitalist um, country if it isn't already. And um, there might be some things you can point to that are leftovers from the Soviet Union, but it's that's growing less and less all the time. And um, finally, one could say that the Soviets got bogged down in Afghanistan in a land war in Asia. And I think that they could very well get bogged down in the Ukraine to the great detriment of, Russian, of the Russian people and the Russian working class, not to mention, of course, the Eastern European working class. That's all I have to say. You know, you, you, you said something here about the Chinese working class supporting the American working class. And it, and it leads me to just something going beyond what you said. You know, and I've gotten into these conversations and giving talks, Sharon, up back here. You know, you know, you hear this stuff. Well, this guy made it, this guy or this gal made it on their own. And I try to explain. I said, no, you, you made it on your own. I said, if if Chiqui if uh, if United Fruit or Chiquita Banana, if you will, didn't didn't control Guatemala. That's just it's just just as an example, just as an example. You know, we have a big store here called Stu Leonard's. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. They bill themselves as the largest grocery store and all that other stuff. But anyway, I go here and bananas are 49 cents a pound, 59 cents a pound. Now, and I try to explain to people that if, if the people themselves actually had a voice in their government, if you had a more, so, a, so, a more, a more, a more democratic state, a better a system of representative government, I said, and they develop their economy. Do you honestly think that that you were gonna you're gonna continue paying 59 cents a pound for bananas? No, these people are gonna want to make more money to, to have to have some sort of lifestyle. So maybe what you're gonna pay is what? 99 cents a pound, a buck nine, dollar nineteen, dollar twenty-nine a pound, right? But at least those people are not coming to the border. They're able to make a living. Isn't that, isn't that what the market system is supposed to be about, supposedly? Now, I said, so if you're telling me you made this totally on your own, you got help from the same people that are trying to get in, into the country through Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. And they look at you like you got two heads. Some of them don't even get it. And it's, it's interesting how the narrative is skewed here. Now, as far as the Russian communist and the Russian parliament, I would urge you to recall what happened in Germany back in 1915, 1916, 1917, when in the Russian, because this, this leads to what they call the silent coup, when the German high command, the general, the well-known general staff in the guise of Paul von Hindenburg and, and Erich Ludendorff took control of the German government on August 29, 1916. Now, nobody died here. There was no bloodshed. They simply told the Kaiser, look, Willie, this ain't working. Why don't you go back to the estate, saw the wood and tend the garden and we'll handle it from here. Yet the war, they're not gonna win the war. And so in the Russian, in the German parliament, you see the Catholic center party, uh, the social Democrats, a rise of a democratic party. And these people are gonna to try to form later on, you know, something known as the Weimar Republic. Why? Because Germany lost the war. Now, are you gonna, I'm not saying you're gonna see the same thing here in Russia, but history does, does, make, does, does urge you to see that if this war goes south for the Russians, are you gonna see the same sort of thing happen here in Russia? Again, what I said earlier, people are people. 
you know, we all we have different societies. We all, we we do some things different, but the basic human condition is the basic human condition, and that's what we're talking about here. Not just talking about Russians and Americans, Chinese, Japanese, Indians, whatever the case may be. The human condition is the human condition. When it when, and when it wants something, it wants something. It makes no difference who it is. Thank. You. Well, on that note, um, thanks everybody for the the session. I think it's time for it to for us to bring in the formal part of our session, and we're going to end the recording. And only this part of the session will be posted. <laughs>